So we've just decomposed C3 tends to C3 tends to C3 into its irreducible pieces. There was this triangular piece, which was uh, gamma 3, 0. This actually turns out to be sim 3 of uh, C3, which we know sits inside this tensor power. There are two copies of gamma 1, 1, and there is one lonely copy of C, just the trivial subrepresentation. So now for something completely different. Here is a table of subatomic particles. These are baryons. That means they're heavy particles, things like protons and neutrons. They're here in, in the table. But there are also lots of other things. So there's sigma particles and lambdas and xis and deltas and sigma stars. I don't even know what they are. But anyway, there's a lot of particles and they were all discovered in particle accelerators in the 1950s and 1960s and people didn't really know what to do with them. They sort of had this idea that protons and neutrons are important, they're inside atoms and you, know, you need to understand them for the uh, you know, nuclear structure of an atom. But what about these other guys? What are they doing there? Why are there so many of them? And you know, how to classify them? Well the diagrams I've drawn here, we're grouping them first according to their spin. So this is some uh, sort of quantum mechanical quantity that you should think of as like an internal angular momentum for the particle. You could measure it by putting the particle in a magnetic field and seeing which way it goes. And um, within each group of, sort of constant spin, I have uh, sorted them according to two more quantum numbers, the charge, that's the electric charge, uh, which is like one for the proton, minus one for the electron. So the electron isn't here, it's not a baryon, it's not a heavy particle. Um, but the neutron is neutral, hence the name, so that's got charge zero. Some of them are negative charge, some are positive charge. This guy's got charge two, delta plus plus. So the plus or the zero or the minus tells you the charge. The other quantum number here is strangeness, that's a bit harder to explain. So. You should imagine that, you know, if you're looking at subatomic particles in as much as you can look at them, you can imagine, you know, maybe something neutral decaying into something negative and something positive. And that would be OK because charge would be conserved, right? You start with no charge, you end up with no net charge. And that would be OK. But some sometimes charge is not enough to rule out certain things from happening and you don't observe them happening, so there must be some reason why they don't happen. So strangeness is a number that was invented to explain why certain interactions don't occur. Okay, so for these particles, strangeness starts off as zero and minus one on this diagonal here, minus two on this diagonal here. And if you plot them according to their charge and their strangeness, you get these diagrams. One looks a bit like a triangle and one is a hexagon and there are two particles in the middle, the sigma zero and the lambda. So let's just go up a minute. We've just seen triangles and hexagons occurring in a totally different context, that of uh, representations of SU3. And actually the triangle, uh, you know, has all these vertices. Each vertex corresponds to a one dimensional weight space. The hexagon has one dimensional weight spaces except over the origin where it has two dimensional weight space. And here, you know, our triangle has one particle over every vertex except, you know, there's nothing here. So that's a bit odd. Uh, but the hexagon has one over every vertex except the origin where it has two. So what's going on? Is there a link? Well, the physicists uh, Gelman and uh, Neyman Um, independently suggested that yes there should actually be a link it's not a coincidence that we're getting the same pictures here moreover they were so convinced about this that uh, you know at least Gelman predicted the existence of a particle down here called omega minus with strangeness minus three and charge minus one um, with spin three halves which was discovered two years later in a particle accelerator so this was in the early 1960s and so I want to explain what it was that had them so convinced that there's a connection here. So what is the proposal? The 
proposal is that each of these particles should be made up of three smaller particles called quarks. Why three quarks? Well, because this is C3 tends to C3 tends to C3. There are three factors of C3. So it's not the three in the exponent. It's the fact there are three factors in the tensor product because each factor will correspond to a single quark. So three quarks and each quark has three flavors. There are three flavors it can come in. So the flavors are up, down, and strange, which just refers to some combination of other properties. So up quarks have a charge, so charge usually written Q, equal to two thirds. Down quarks have a charge minus a third, and strange quarks also have charge minus a third. Uh, and up quarks have strangeness zero, so do down quarks but strange quarks have strangeness minus one. Minus because I think it's just a convention that's the same as the sign of the electric charge. Okay, so flavor just refers to some combination of properties um, of these particles, these quarks. And the thing is, from the point of view of the strong nuclear force, which is the thing people were really interested in when they were looking at these particles, the electric charge doesn't play a role and nor does the strangeness. The only things these are really for are for telling you, you know, from, from the point of view of the strong force, is telling you when certain um, interactions are forbidden because they would violate charge conservation or strangeness conservation. They don't actually tell you how strong the strong force is. You know, Q tells you how strong the electromagnetic force is, not the strong force. So from the point of view of the strong force, these three quarks are actually the same. And in quantum mechanics, you know, we don't really have something that's up, something that's down, and something that's strange. We're allowed to take linear combinations of these guys. So any state, you know, you can, or any two states, you can take a linear combination to get a sort of intermediate state or combination of states. It's called a superposition. So in fact, each quark, rather than having three possible flavors, each quark has state space C3, three-dimensional complex vector space where the axes in this space correspond to the up state, the down state, and the strange state. So if a quark happens to be, you know, in the state where it uh, sort of points in this direction, the up direction, it knows it's an up quark. If it happens to be in the at a state on the down axis, then it knows it's a down quark. But if it's in this state, just, you know, some combination, then it doesn't know if it's an up, down, or a strange quark. It could be any any of those. Okay, so each quark has a three-dimensional state space. So if you have three quarks, the way you figure out the state space for the combination is you take the tensor product. So three quarks have state space C3, tensor C3, tensor C3. That's just a general fact about quantum mechanics. If you have two systems, each with state space sort of V and W, then to get the state space of the combination, you just tensor them together. Okay. Now the fact that the strong force doesn't know the difference between these three quarks means that there's a symmetry of this three-dimensional space, state space. And the proposal was that this should be an SU3 flavor symmetry. And that this should really be the standard representation of, of SU3. In other words, you know, you are allowed to uh, rotate your quark from being an up quark to a down quark and the strong force won't know about it. This is approximately true, right? So it's, it's not really true you can rotate it up to a down quark because you would change the uh, the charge and other things. But from the purposes of the strong force, I don't think it really cares. But now, if you've got three quarks all combined together like this, then something interesting happens. So although SU2, SU3 can't tell the difference between an up quark and a down quark, it can tell the difference between 
different combinations of three quarks. So this is because the standard representation is irreducible. Basically, you can rotate you know, any way you want in this diagram, from up to down to strange, it doesn't matter. But C3 tends to C3 tends to C3 decomposes in a non-trivial way. It has an irreducible sub-representation of these symmetric tensors, and it has these sort of gamma 1 1s and, and this copy of C down here. And you can't rotate using SU3 from this sub-representation gamma 3 0 to any of these other ones. For example, this trivial sub-representation here consists of completely anti-symmetric tensors. Um, let, let me maybe go down and, and write out what this means. If the basis vectors are up, down, and strange, then a completely anti-symmetric combination of these would be up, tensor, down, tensor, strange, uh, minus down, tensor, up, tensor, strange, um, plus down, tensor, strange, tensor, up. Each time I'm just switching two of them, so I stick an extra sign in. Uh, minus up, tensor, strange, tensor, down, switching these two, plus strange, tensor, up, tensor, down, minus strange, tensor, down, tensor, up. That's sort of all you can do, right? That's a completely anti-symmetric combination of U, up, down, and strange. And it's actually up to scale the only one. So this is the thing that spans the trivial um, one-dimensional sub-representation. Um, inside C3 tends to C3 tends to C3. And there's no way to rotate from this combination of quarks to something symmetric like up tensor up tensor up. Right? The strong force would know you've done that. It's somehow sensitive to that. So that's the point of grouping these particles according to these sub-representations, because the strong force knows these particles apart from these particles. It can tell these particles apart from these particles. That's the idea. So the physicists have fancy names for these groups. Uh, this is called the baryon decuplet, because there are 10 of them. At least there are now known to be 10, as of 1964. And this one is called the baryon octet, because there are eight of them. Now, the weird thing for me is that there are two octets here in this decomposition, um, but there's only one baryon octet. Um, so the reason for this, I think, is because we've been a bit careless. We should really have also considered spin while we were doing all this. So really, it's not just an up quark and a down quark. There's also a spin up, up quark, and a spin down, up quark, etc. So there are really many more states, and we need to take combinations of those. And I think if you do that in a careful way, you end up with just one baryon octet. That's just a, a side remark, in case you were wondering. Confused me. Next remark, um, there are other particles that aren't baryons. So baryon means heavy particle. Uh, there are things called mesons, which are sort of medium weight particles. Um, and they also fit into a similar picture. Uh, so mesons come about by sticking together a quark and an antiquark. Antiquarks don't transform according to the standard representation. They transform according to the dual of the standard representation. So we'll talk about that next time. And, uh, and we'll be able to derive the classification of mesons that way. So I think this is one of my favorite pieces of applied maths. It's like, it takes this really highly non-trivial piece of representation theory and gives it a use, right? It says, you know, the reason for these patterns of particles is because they're made up of these smaller particles and to really understand the pattern that arises, you have to understand a bit of Lee theory.